Good evening to you all. Uh, it is a pr proud moment for us in the Faculty of Humanities uh, to be hosting uh, Professor Phil van Skalvik's uh, inaugural lecture tonight. An inaugural, an inaugural lecture is a momentous occasion uh, in one's career. It is a right to passage where one gets the opportunity to profess their knowledge and to share their genius discoveries both with the academic and non-academic community. And we're here to witness just that tonight and to celebrate with Professor Phil. On behalf of Professor Phil, I would like to welcome our distinguished guests and functionaries for the evening tonight, uh, notably our Deputy Vice-Chancellor, uh, Professor Robert Balfour, the Deputy Dean for Research and, in, in, and, in, and Innovation uh, in the Faculty of Humanities, uh, Professor Mirna Nell. Um, I'm aware that uh, the other two uh, Deputy Deans are also following the proceedings online, so welcome. Uh, and also to recognize the school directorate and other uh, directors who are here. A warm, a warm welcome to all members of Phil's family present here or attending virtually, notably his sister Lynn and her partner Peter, and his brother Johan and sister-in-law Heidi, also his dear friends from Belgium who became like family and are attending online. Uh, Stephen Francis, uh, Ewa Brzezinska, a, w a special welcome to mentors who played a role at various points in Phil's life, including Professor Hilna Duploy, Hein Filion, Jacques van, van, de, van, van de Elst, Bani Kastens, Ati Delange, and Ip Franken. A special word of welcome to Africans, author Piro Becker and his wife, 
Phil has published on Piro's work, the conversations with, author, with the author stemming from, from that are uh, described by Phil as particularly rewarding and enriching. Welcome also to former colleagues from the subject group Afrikaans and Dutch, former and pres present uh, postgraduate students, and colleagues from the School of Languages and other schools. Last but not least, also a uh, uh, warm welcome to Professor Adri Breed, uh, Phil's sister uh, in academia. The son of Johan and Lorraine van Skalvik, Phil was born in Ferenaching in 1972. He spent his family, he spent his early formative years in the beautiful Mpumalanga province. He says some of his, his fondest memories are of his mother reading from the volume of the Afrikaans Children's Encyclopedia, containing fairy tales from across the world. And on her lap, paging through the beautiful edition of Marvels and Mysteries of the Animal World. He matriculated at Wombats High School in Bella Bella in 1990, where he excelled in languages. Teachers like Ms. Maria Erasmus and Dr. Johan Drodsky, uh, through their inspired teaching, contributed immensely to further developing his love of literature and learning. He enrolled at the Pochefstrom Poch University for Christian Higher Education in 1991. His academic foundation was laid in the Afrikaans and Dutch, Dutch and English, where he was fortunate to learn from true legends in these departments. He went on to complete his MA in Afrikaans and Dutch and Literature, cum laude, under the supervision of Professor Hilna Duploy, uh, with Professors Jacques uh, van de Est, uh, Van de Kastens as co-supervisors, and for which he was awarded the Marius Just Medal. In 2004, he obtained a PhD in general theory of literature at the Northwest University under the promotorship of Professor Hein Filion. The research for both his MA and PhD included stays abroad, uh, respectively in Antwerp, uh, Belgium, between 1996 and 97, and Leiden in the, in the Netherlands in 2000, where Prof. Yves Franken was his mentor. From September 2001 until March 2006, he was a senior lecturer at the Adam uh, Mekiewicz University in Poland, where he taught several modules in the program South African Studies, established by Professor Jesse Koch under the directorship of the leg legendary Professor uh, Jacek Fisiak. The years in Poland, he has described as trans transformative. He returned to the Northwest University in April 2006, and in 2008, he was appointed in the subject group Afrikaans and Dutch School of Languages, where he has been teaching Afrikaans and Dutch literature uh, and literary theory. Phil has published uh, extensively in peer-reviewed books and journals in his field and is widely respected uh, and recognized as an international scholar. Six, six years ago, in the nick of time, he met Professor Tinas Botha and so began a whole new life. The rest is history, as they say. Let me take this opportunity to congratulate Professor Phil van Skalvak and uh, and to invite him uh, at this stage to come and give his lecture. Professor Phil.
Een van die bekendste 20ste eeuwse fotografe, Cecil Beaton, wat een groot deel van daar die eeuwse cultuurgeschiedenis van vanaf die roaring twenties. Part of the century's cultural history from the roaring twenties to the hippie movement of the 1960s. Replied in a fairly camp way in a 1962 interview when asked about his relationship with the past, namely that he had left the past behind and only kept the hat. Referring to the hat on his head on which he was pulsed earlier in the interview, he stated that the hat imbued him with a certain Edwardian bravura and left the matter at that. I will attempt to delve a bit deeper into the relationship with the past, specifically within a literary artistic context. In the background to my lecture lies a type of discourse that I myself have participated in, specifically with regard to the novel writing of Eben Finter, namely the exploration of, amongst other things, the father-son relationship as part of a project that aims to take on the patriarchal and hegemonic maleness in social and psychological contexts and with regard to the literary canon. We are indeed living, as captured in the title of the Flemish writer Monica van Palmel's novel from 1985, in the time of the accursed fathers. In Eben Fenter's latest novel, Green Like the Heaven Above, there is, in this regard, a move in the direction towards a reconciliatory perspective to the relationship with the deceased father, as well as the very elderly mother, both typical Afrikaners of their time. The protagonist in Green Like the Heaven Above, Simon Avent, his sustained exploration later as an adult of sexual intimacy is intertwined with the suppressed workings of a Puritan Afrikaner maleness during his formative years and the role of his, of his father, a successful farmer. Both matters are talked through in a series of therapy sessions with Dr. Spiteri, during which she repeatedly provides the example of the ancient Greeks' integrative and empowering view on self-actualization, especially re as reactivated by Michel Foucault. At one of the later sessions, the sad story of the death of the gaunt farm worker Jackson deserted in his space worker's house in the heart of winter is brought forward by Simon, which raises the theme of complicity and blame. It is told how Jackson had no family or children, or perhaps he did have children somewhere, but who knows where they went. Through wrestling with the memories of Jackson's death, like those memories that relate to the protagonist's own father, and the eventual telling of Jackson's sad and reverential story. A type of reconciliation is suggested within a greater South African human family. We, as South Africans, indeed have many fathers and mothers. The power of affiliation is also lauded by other writers in other places. The Irish poet and Nobel Prize winner Seamus Heaney, whose poetry has grown from the earth and nature of his people, and the deep-rooted Irish speech, and when it was needed, also testified of intense political engagement, has increasingly become, like Stephanie Burt indicates in a recent New Yorker article, a poet of happiness, a poet of friendship and family, of careful and long-felt affiliation, and deeply connected with thousands of years of poetic tradition, as shown by his translation of Beowulf. Heaney's poetry for me as a literary scholar, specifically as a scholar of Afrikaans literature, already for a long time has been groundbreaking and a source of inspiration. Of specific interest for what I'm trying to undertake is Heaney's inaugural lecture, The Redress of Poetry, as Oxford Professor of Poetry in 1989. Garcia maps the development of Heaney's poetry with reference to three key essays from his pen, Feeling into Words, The Government of the Tongue, and The Redress of Poetry. 
and the first, the finding and expressing of that which most deeply informs the poet, namely the personal and collective past histories, is placed on the foreground. And in the second, he speaks about self-control and the control of the medium through which the poet gains great authority and social influence. Garcia summarizes as follows. Here he asserts his view that poetry may be considered useful even in our agitated and chaotic modern world because it verifies our singularity and functions not as a factor of distraction but of concentration for both poet and reader. So revealing again its governing power. Underlying this and elaborated further in the redress of poetry is the tension between art and engagement, between finding a unique poetic voice and a public voice. In close relation to this, like Garcia states, are those topics concerning the author's processes of growing psychological maturity as an individual and as a poet embodied in his personal roots, i.e. those of family, home and religion. Built into this is a continuously self-critical evaluation of their own writing achievement. The weighing up of that against scholarly demands and the socio-historical reality against their own predecessors. This brings us to the theme of redress rectification or restitution. In the redress of poetry, he speaks about how poetry's existence as a form of art relates to our existence as citizens in society. He understands redress as adding your weight to the lighter, unacknowledged or neglected side. The contribution that the poet, however, renders in this regard is not directly activistic. It rather places a counter-reality in the scales. By reading the type of poetry that he describes as completely adequate, the reader experiences something bracing and memorable, because it is also important, as he states, to redress poetry as poetry, to set it up as its own category to, in the terminology of Derek Attridge, acknowledge the singularity of literature and to safeguard it as something which is realized anew and uniquely in every successful work. In following a thinker like Philip Kubersky, my approach in this lecture is synthesizing rather than critical oppositional and now turn to what Hogan calls the neglected and misunderstood topic of literary universals. And in this regard, hegemonic universalism is rejected in favor of empathetic universalism, based on the assumption that all people share ethical and experiential subjectivity, and that universality must both derive from and contribute to the sense of shared subjectivity. The distant journeys that I will undertake and the synthesis still in process that I propose, however, take place from the home of the Afrikaans language and literature that is my subject. It is not a limiting detail because the academic home that I live in has large windows. In the South African philosopher Martinus Verfeldt's essays about homes, the following, amongst other things, is said about how one experiences from a house in reality. Your house places you in the world. Therefore, your house is a type of flesh and blood from which you assume and build up the world. You go in to go out, and you go out to go in. Where it stands determines your view, and how it looks inside determines your opinion of the world outside. The Nigerian poet Wali Soyinka in 2002 published Samarkand and other markets I have known, wherein markets across the world are celebrated and problematized. The same titled long poem filled with the philosophy of life shifts the attention to the market as a place of dynamic and peaceful meetings as well as of temporary displacement, where everybody is away from home. Much more than simply money and goods are exchanged here, and trade therefore also takes place to the benefit and spir of the sp spiritual household. 
trade and holy places, saints and salesmen have ever lived as souls companions. The pilgrim trade is evenly sanctified. The nature of the inaugural lecture, according to my understanding, therefore brilliantly seems to lend itself to the reconstruction of the type of approach that most deeply underlies my research and teaching. In this process of reflection, crystallized for me in the title, The Living Past of Literature. I'm thoroughly aware of the fact that a focus on the literary past and an exploration thereof of the fashion in which I undertake it in this inaugural lecture is not something obvious in our time. Peter Becker's short story, When It Rains on Tanquastrov, problematizes the retrospective action. Becker looks at the filial relationships, the phases of the farm through war, drought and floods, and the culpability of colonial offenses. The very elderly Ma'ani insists on visiting the farm again, during which she wants to do the one thing that she neglected doing when they had to leave the farm, namely to also neatly murilo the entrance, and therefore lime and salt are bought en route. The conclusion of the story notes with implicit reference to the biblical story of Lot's wife who looked back to the destruction of the city of Sin, Sodom, the action of turning back to the past as transgressive. But it is made bespoke through Ma'ani decisively hanging the inherited little woman's cloak over the bag of lime with the added salt mixed in. So let us stand like that then, pillar of salt. The small closure ritual ties into the former custom of handing over a clean house to new people moving in by whitewashing the walls after evacuation. In the last chapter of The Sense of an Ending, Frank Kermode quotes from the final stanza of Philip Larkins' poem, Reference Back. Truly, though our element is time, we are not suited to the long perspective, open at each instant of our lives. They link us to our losses worse. They show us what we have as it once was, blindingly undiminished, just as though by acting differently we could have kept it so. I've realized that what interests me is the challenging part of the long perspectives the loss and the continuation, the confrontational and the healing relating to it, and the complex rhizomatic intertextuality that accompanies it. My search then also looked at matters like the following. Weight, weighing and being weighed, putting your weight behind this or that, value, determining value, being regarded of value or not, being regarded as being part of something or not, belonging to or not, and your own perceptions, prohibitions, and concessions in this regard. Peter Becker, a veteran of the Afrikaans literature, and somewhat neglected and underappreciated, is busy with similar reflections and doubts in his recent book of poetry, Before I Could Find Myself. In the final stanza of the final poem, when I f could find myself, he almost cynically has to state, there weren't any gatherings arranged, nor any search parties organized. Hereby, he continues an important motive in his work, which he brings to a head. The past and the distance covered in the path of the writer, indeed, stand in relation to settlement. In the sense of submitting a return, containing all details pertaining to debit and credit, as well as debt and settlement of debt to be done with it. As far as sieving through the personal and collective past is concerned, to discern the greater or lesser va value of things within the context of the long perspectives, Johan Mayberg's poetry is, in my mind, groundbreaking within contemporary Afrikaans literature. Here I focus on a poem from his third work, Chamber Music, that appeared in 2008. The possible link that the title of the book wants to suggest it has with Joyce's book of poetry, Chamber Music of 1907, is to my sense only implicit. Chamber Music was Joyce's debut work, and with its moderate lyrical approach, 
a moderate lyrical approach, it's difficult to reconcile it with the great modernist prose work that the author would render. In my view, my book evokes the book of choice to further problematize the poetic craftsmanship, which, amongst other things, can be self-nurturing. From Mayberg's chamber music, I present only the poem Portmanteau for analysis. We have a small box, a functional reconstruction from carved panels of an old piano that with family baggage like a small arc from one generation to the next wanders. The sweet spot hat and cellophane with crocheted baby stuff smells of moth killer like my childhood. Like all the letters, papers, irreplaceable snapshots in me, my family lives inclusively. I represent one of many lines in portraits of my father in his posture. I see myself also stand so naturally in the manner how we write, with my hand rubbing the forehead. What is my own? What is inherited? With what is settled? With what will I die? Aspects of two related meanings, distinctions of the word portmanteau, which serve as title of the poem, are play in the background. Firstly, a large, sturdy travel bag, which open up into two equal parts. And secondly, the merging of parts of two existing words to form a new word, a coffer word. In spite of the fact that the poem contains the example of the coffer word, cellophane, a combination of cellulose and diaphane, the two meanings of portmanteau mentioned above are rather realized indirectly through the two-part construction between, for example, the own and the inherited, and performed in the verse technique that prioritizes duality, namely using the pair rhyming couplet that would be a simplistic and defunct form, but gets revitalized through, amongst other things, the traveling mobility of the enjambment by choosing for a complex approach instead of a more obvious settlement. The poem demonstrates to us how the exploration of the imperative final question with what is settled, with what will I die, could be explored. My lecture is not directly concerned with history as a subject area, nor systematically directed to the literary representation thereof, for example, in historical novels, but rather on literary past as de demonstrated with reference to selected texts that are telescoped in a comparative context. Nonetheless, the French-American cultural historian Jacques Bazon's book, From Dawn to Decadence, helped me shape my thoughts while pre preparing for this lecture. The era Bazoum investigates is introduced with the origin of modernity in approximately the year 1500 and approaches its end with the arrival of the decadence and with it modernism. The decadence wherein we would broadly still find ourselves is characterized according to Bazoum by a restless search in all directions for something new. The groups that consequently originated lead to all forms of separatism with nothing but constraints at every turn, because the stranger, the machine, the bureaucrats rule, impose their will. Hence, the desire to huddle in small groups whose ways are congenial. So the consequences of this are, according to Boazun, that it inspires the repeated use of the dismissus prefixes, prefixes, anti and post, and to promise to reinvent this or that institution. That is why, Bozun states, there is an urge to build a wall against the past. However, he points to the fact that history, with all its complex connections, is built by unnameable hands and heads. The enduring force of these deeds is what is meant by the living past. Julia Kristeva expressed the return to memory and the self uniquely in an interview by linking it to revolt. Revolt is a very deep movement of discontent, anxiety and anguish. In this sense, to say that revolt is only politics is a betrayal of this vast movement. Therefore, if we still want to conquer new horizons, it is necessary to turn away from this idea 
and to give the word revolt a meaning that is not just political. I try to interpret this word in a philosophical and etymological sense. The word revolt comes from a Sanskrit root that means to discover, open, but also to turn, to return. On a more philosophical level, there is a meaning that I want to rehabilitate. It is the idea that being is within us and that the truth can be acquired by a retrospective return, by memory. Reflecting on the return to the self in relation to the other. And then, in specifically, the craft to the craft of writing is looked at in Alfred Schaeffer's recent essay on op de rug gezien. Het evenings-nummer van de dachter, seen from the back, the balancing act of the poet. Alfred Schaffer, born on the Caribbean island Aruba, part of the Dutch Antilles, is a lecturer at the University of Stellenbosch and has since 1996 been living in South Africa almost uninterruptedly. It is here where he began to write poetry in his mother tongue, Dutch. He has become in he has developed into one of the leading newer voices in Dutch poetry and received the most important literary award, the P.C. Wirft Prize in 2021. In 2019, he presented the Hans Groenewege Lecture in Ghent and Amsterdam, and it was simultaneously published in book format. In this lecture, he delves into a specific personal experience in 2004 of community poetry in the Cape Township, Delft, which challenged his own thoroughly modern conceptions about poetry as an impersonal hermetic linguistic construct. The type of ideas that also resonate with T.S. Eliot's well-known poetic statements about impersonal poetry, where the emotion is seated in the poem and not in the history of the poet. On that watershed day, Schaefer saw a mother of a rape victim recite her own poem with her back turned to the audience. The core of what Schaefer learnt from the Delft Poetry Recital is that here it is not about something absolutely self sentimental or self centered. That woman in her destitution specifically thought of poetry as a way to establish and convey her trauma. The fact that she recited her poem with her back turned to the audience could, at face value, be ascribed to the painful content thereof and a shame or a sense of shame. But Schaefer retrospectively realized that it also spoke of the belief that the poem could completely bring her into presence of her experience could stand there in her place. Eliot states in his well-known essay from 1919, Tradition and the Individual Talent, that renewal cannot be separated from literary tradition. An important new work engages conversation with the tradition and in turn brings about a rearrangement or shift, however slight it may be, to the tradition as a whole. To deliver, to deliver a work of contemporary value and meaning, the writer, according to Eliot, will not know what they should do next unless he lives in what is not merely the present but in the present moment of the past, unless he is conscious not of what is dead, but of what is already living. Our own Martinez Versfeld, in his essays, What is Contemporary, states that tradition can be described as a consistent technique of renewal. To understand what being contemporary could entail in our own context, the examiner could perhaps begin by consulting the large supply of world literature of the global south in general and the Mexican literature in particular, and to look at the literary agency of a previous generation as exemplary of a pre previous generation. The novelist Carlos Fuentes, in an essay from 1988, How I Started to Write, points to the decisive importance that the rediscovery of his own Mexican tradition had for his generation, and he makes this provocative statement. For my generation in Mexico, the problem did not consist in discovering our modernity, but in discovering our tradition. 
learners used to be deprived of this aspect of teaching at school because attention was given to classical works. This included Miguel de Cervantes' Don Quixote, in which the protagonist's naive mimicking of heroic deeds in medieval chivalric romances um, that he read are told in a highly entertaining yet also debunkingly parodying fashion. For the early 17th, 17th century, this approach was fresh and modern. The sustained and intense interest of Cervantes, also Fuentes, and his generation would later become quite clear to him. But in the development of Fuentes' own writing craft, the influence of the Mexican poet and diplomat Octavio Paz played a more immediate role. Paz, through the example of his writing, demonstrated that Mexico is not an isolated backward province, but forms part of the whole human family, contemporary with all men and women. Paz would late in his life in 1990 become the first Mexican writer to receive the Nobel Prize for Literature. But he made his influence count even long before this. In the generous friendship of Octavio Paz, I learned that nothing should be left out of literature, because our time is a time of deadly reduction. The essential orphanhood of our time is seen in the poetry and thought of Paz as a challenge to be met through the renewed flux of human knowledge, of all human knowledge. Fuentes had begun to suspect that the discovery of the tradition was also an outwards movement, as it became clear to him that the poetics of Paz is an act of civilizations, a movement of encounters. The question that follows from this, from the focalization angle of the young Fuentes, is unique and universal. Could I, a Mexican who had not yet written his first book, sitting on a bench, on an early spring day, as the bees are from the Ura Mountains quieted down, have the courage to explore for myself with my language, with my tradition, with my friends and influences. That region where the literary figure bids us consider it in the uncertainty of its gestation. Cervantes did it in a precise cultural situation. He brought into existence the modern world by having Don Quixote leave his secure village and take to the open roads the roads of the unsheltered, the unknown, and the different. There, to lose what he read and to gain what we, the readers, read in him. These words powerfully resonate with Bakhtin's views of the uninterrupted dialogue wherein artistic texts find themselves throughout the centuries within what he calls great time. Works break through the boundaries of their own time. They live in centuries, that is, in great time, and frequently with great works always. Their lives there are more intense and fuller than are their lives within their own time. Indeed, Don Quixote also belongs to the Mexican literature of centuries later. Moreover, it belongs to the entire humanity and, demonst as demonstrates by Octavio Paz in his term to Carlos Fuentes, how the world can meet the poetic world. The coda of Paz's well-known poem, Letter of Testimony, reads, Perhaps to love is to learn to walk through this world, to learn to be silent like the oak and the linden of the fable, to learn to see your glance scattered seeds it planted a tree. I talk because you shake its leaves. Something of this type of construction in the world, attentively learning and loving, is embodied in his writing craft and humanity by our own Eiskricha, an Afrikaans poet whose, li whose journey led him to experience Spain and Spanish literature firsthand. Kricha, through his supple translations from Spanish poetry and his essays thereof, introduced the Spanish world and its rich literary tradition to Afrikaans readers. In his essay about Jorge Guillén, 
poet of the land, he distinguishes between the northern Castilian poetry as represented by Guyen and the southern Andalusian. According to Kricha, the Castilian poet is above all a vertical poet, while the Andalusian poet can be described as horizontal, which is why he confines himself, himself to the visible, tangible world as he knows it, and he finds his joy and peace there especially. This probably explains why I have for a long time been attracted to the Andalusian writer Juan Ramon Jimenez, in particular in his early semi-autobiographical work, A Platero and I. In this book, consisting of prose poems, uh, which would receive the 1956 Nobel Prize for Literature, Jimenez describes the social gatherings and local experiences of the lovable little donkey Platero and a seemingly naive owner as observed from the aforementioned perspective and with the backdrop of the seasons and the simple town life of Moguer, Jimenez's place of birth. Platero was also translated into Afrikaans in 1981 in Leti Pretorius's commission Mendable translation, Akin Platero, uh, under Lucy's Elohim. The donkey Platero also belongs to the whole community and connects the speaker to nature, to fellow humans, and to the town events. In James Kutsia's recent late essays, 2006 to 2017, an essay is dedicated to Platero and I. Kutsia emphasizes that Platero, without him being humanized, gets established as a fully fledged character. And with this, Kutsia highlights the mutual glance between Platero and his owner. Something that comes to the fore in Kutsia's insightful essay, without him stating it as such, is that the post Cartesian view of the animal isn't something which has just been brought through animal studies, but that has already, with much obviousness, been performed in a work like Platero and I. It points to the fact that Platero and I, that is often marketed as a children's book, actually is not. But that the power of this work precisely lies in the sustaining of the childlike, in the experiences and in the interactions that are recalled by an adult who hasn't lost touch with the intensity of a child's experiences. In February 1932, James Joyce wrote the poem Eke Puer. In this poem, he celebrates the birth of his grandson in that month and mourns the death of his father at the end of the previous year. In spite of the fact that this is a poem that follows the large highlights of his writing career, as far as the sensitive wording and its simple song-like quality and quatrain format is concerned, it reaches back to his first book of poetry, Chamber Music, Echo Poer, of the dark past a child is born, with joy and grief my heart is torn. Calm in his cradle the living lies, may love and mercy unclose his eyes. Young life is breathed on the, gro on the glass, the world that was not comes to pass, a child is sleeping, an old man gone, O oh, father forsaken, forgive your son. Carol Rubens states that what we have here is a secular nativity. The miracle that is suggested in the words, the world that was not comes to pass, is the birth of a normal son, not the Messiah. And here it is not Christ who is separated from God the Father, but the speaker's old father who is separated from his son. Because here Joyce is trying to attest his feelings of guilt because, through his note, he did not return to Ireland while his father was on his deathbed. The poem mediates between the dark past and the new world that is realized through the child, upon which he can cast his unclosed eyes. As far as the life-confirming role that literature can play in this regard, the work of Peter be Becker can be directive. It is striking that the curve of appreciation for the poetry of Becker was on the incline with his later work. Becker was, as far as this revival is concerned, at a more advanced age. 
part of what at the time was felt to be the growth point in Afrikaans poetry. In my Becker profile that featured in 2015 in Perspective and Profile, I indicated by studying his oeuvre as a whole that his work is characterized by a universal elemental attitude, where the sun motive features repeatedly, and where the prioritization of the archetype of Puer Eternus, the eternal youth or child, also features. In the context of Becker's oeuvre, a key text in this regard is Becker's 1980 novel, Mana Komran, wherein the title character, a former boxing champion, attends a childhood, a childhood gang reunion. The start of Mana Komran contains, amongst other things, the following directional perspective. If a guy strikes a blow for your country, you shouldn't be frightened by the blow struck by a reunion. A reunion is made by which you have personally achieved. This is the one happening that doesn't hang in the air. He knows that they are gossiping behind his back. They say that he has never outgrown the boy in him. But you do not outgrow a boy like a bad chest. What a man who is a man has outgrown his boy. Through this, another key matter is activated by Becker, who obviously has to do with the thematic complexity of youth, adulthood, and age, namely the weighing of achievement, specifically in your field. The question of what has become of you matters that typically feature at reunion. In the recent two age books of Becker, one literary intention is looked at with intense urgency and relativizations. Buckler, Becker's book, Atlas Against Vergetrafir, can fruitfully be read in terms of he described in his prize lecture as growing up to that which we stored up as we grew. Being a stock taking, what a nice word, right? Growing up to that which we stored up as we grew. Being a stock taking of what has been collected over a lifetime. Deeply rooted metaphorical bridges are stretched across oblivion over the gorge that, according to Hillman, in modern society and in the psyche, gapes between the Senex, one old man, and Puer, where the falcon is separated from the falconer. In the poem, not about the dog, which can be read along with Nota Bene, our retriever, the relationship with mortality is portrayed by means of an old man and a lively, playful young dog. The dog surges ahead and rushes off to a seagull, seagull into the sea, over waves like a jumping horse, and indeed retrieves something, returns newly born and shakes a cloud of droplets over my hair. Head Atlas, a touching poem about a father and son in Atlas Dindir Vergetrafir, can be brought into context with an earlier poem of Becker, sonnet by uh, at grandfather's portrait from the 1975 book Future Relations, as well as with digging the well-known opening poem from Seamus Heaney's debut book, where his own early writing craft is reflected on with reference to the father. The second to last and final stanzas read, the cold smell of potato mold, the squelch and slap of soggy peat, the curd cuts of an edge, through living roots awaken in my head. But I have no spade to follow men like them. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests. I'll dig with it. Where the relationship between the skillful father and the writer's son in Heaney's poem are represented graphically, uh, with a contrasting and eventually reconciliatory spade and pen, a similar relationship between grandfather and son is expressed in Becker's sonnet at grandfather's portrait through a play with son and sonnet. Sonnet. For me, the wings of a great sonnet are asked of the Lord without a care. I could make itself, but only figuratively, from the red sand of the Tsama bear. For him, sun and thirst, simple, untainted, already early in his life, stalked, captured, and on top of that, God's law and the shouting deer's rigid longing. What does it eventually matter, sun or sonnet?
he truly loved even more intensely than I. He actually also knew the words, and in the starry evenings his hard mouth was a pen, and both of, both of us more deeply shrink into frames, still carry on the name, but with its Nama names. We son and grandson in these poems of Becker and Heening hold the great forebearer in high regard. A reversal takes place in Becker's head atlas through the father, through unskilled treehouse building, randomly looking forward to the arrival of the son, the royal McCoy. The final section of Before I Could Find Myself is called Frontal. In the sonnet, late Renaissance, finds a merging of much of the books and of Becker's poetics. On the one hand, the title indicates the cultural historical details that the sonnet forms part of because the sonnet indeed had its boom during the High Renaissance and later, after centuries worth of neglect, it was revived. Burton McKix state that sonnets mean some version, not always the same version, of literary history. On the other hand, the title of this poem probably also indicates the late flourish and the revival of what is possible in the life of the elderly, as well as in that of the poet at an advanced age, Michelangelo's David sculpture, with its frontal nudity that made middle-class citizens turn in their graves, definitely makes the living highly upset. It is not only an important artistic reference point in art history, but also embodies a view of life that centers in and goes over to action. Thereby, this sculpture is standing as a model for the poet in more than one way, performatively speaking. It should be clear how the various strands of my argument via a revisiting of the underestimated Peter Becker and read through the glasses of Heaney come together. Writing from the own home and language, but with a view on and fed by the wide world with its rich literary and artistic traditions that can be shared and celebrated by everyone and where older writers and artists can be valuable links, growing from and in critical discussion with the past, wrestling with literary value the heritage of the fathers, the own value, and with suitable literary participation in present matters of interest, moving outwards for self-discovery to eventually arrive at home in a more sun-drenched comparison between father and son, and a childlike affirming embrace of life and of the own working with words. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, uh, Professor van Skalkveik, for the lecture. <clears throat> uh, listening to it, I think one can't help but be struck by the poetic nature of the analysis, the spanning of whole literary worlds, in which, of course, the living past is intertwined with really rich themes for patriarchy, masculinity, sexuality, sons and fathers, sons and mothers, race, guilt, judgment, all of which are bound in time as themes that run through the lecture this evening contrasted, I think, with the ideals, of course, expressed of family, of relationship of land that is given freely rather than land that is grabbed violently, dystopically. The reference to other inaugural lectures, I think, was really delightful in your overview this evening. The inaugural lecture being such a seminal part of an academic's development and lifespan. 
And the questions that you asked about how to salvage from the past anything worth holding on to in complex and post-colonial environments, Mexico, South Africa, Australia, are themes which I think the novelists like Fenter and the poet Heaney, both of whom have experiences of colonial possession, amplified by complex matriarchal relations framed by patriarchal values. In this lecture this evening, home is both the place where the heart is as well as the place where the heart is broken. And that is revealed as complex, compromised, but also full in your lectures, unbearably tender in the analysis of child-parent relations. Also ranging from the postmodern to the post-humanist theories, your references to the major canonical works by Joyce, Cervantes, and Paz, to South African literary canon, figures, iconic figures, such as Becker and Kutsia, I think makes for an inaugural lecture that has really been quite magnificent to listen to. And how you managed to pull together across those literary worlds globally these themes concerning intimacy between father and son, mother and son, I think is a, a great achievement for. Of course, the reference to the portmanteau, and I hope I understood that correctly in your talk, um, is a resonant one, isn't it? It's both the things we carry, the baggage we carry from the past, as well as the, as well as the things we choose to salvage. And that sits in awkward proximity with the need that you came back to in several moments in the talk, the need to find sustenance in the, park, in, the, in the past, where in fact the past is so very like a trampled meadow beyond recognition from which we must all still retrieve somehow sustenance, something of value that can sustain life, even if the memories are so painful. I want to end by recalling um, Gloria Anzaldua's understanding of the body as the course of the past written into the lands of the skin. And uh, to, to signal this evening a really deep appreciation for your mastery of the field, Professor Phil, and uh, and an enjoyment, I think, that all of our audience have experienced in, in hearing you range across both the texts as well as the literary worlds and tropes of your analysis. So on that note, Phil, I think let's offer our colleague a hearty round of congratulations. <laughs> At the same time, however, um, we should recognize that the development of our colleague is also the development of this faculty, a large and complex faculty ranging a multiplicity of disciplines, from the literary to the sociological, from the fine arts history, right through to governance and public administration and the like. And in that complex environment, uh, Professor Dumi, and Prof. Merna and colleagues, it is really so very valuable that resources, that time and opportunity are lent to each academic's development in a way that enables them to specialize even in that broad complexity of fields and multidisciplinary work. And I wanted to really express our thanks as leadership, Prof. Dumi, Prof. Merna, and all the leadership of the faculty gathered here this evening for supporting our colleague to reach this point. And then last, but by no means least, are the homes that support us all, the family, the partners, the loved ones, perhaps even the pets on occasion, who enable us to do this wonderful work that results in a specialization that leads to a recognition in an inaugural lecture. So we want to acknowledge also that support that life-sustaining love that underpins everything that we do. Phil, we have, as a university leadership, a gesture of appreciation 
um, that I would like to give to you now, but it needs you to come and stand next to me. Whenever I have to hand out those exquisitely crafted pens, which are, which are um, made by our colleagues in the Faculty of uh, Natural and Agricultural Sciences, I'm tempted to kind of slip one into my pocket, Prof. Do me, I'm a terrible pen thief. <laughs> Don't trust me near the pens. Um, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, friends and family this evening, we've come towards the end of the, of the evening. I'd just like to explain some of the ceremonial to follow. Um, we will have a word of thanks after uh, my note, and then we will stand to sing the national anthem, after which, after which uh, Professor Phil, we would like you to be the first person to exit the venue to stand by the door so that the procession and all the guests have an opportunity to walk out and get a breath of fresh air, take off the masks, and to congratulate you in person um, as we end the, the evening tonight. And then, of course, we can have a good time, colleagues. <laughs> OK, thank you. So before I get to Professor Van Skalkwijk's list of people who deserve a word of thanks, I would like to first express my personal gratitude to him. <laughs> I knew it was going to happen. A full, I can't name it, a group, Afrikaans and Netherlands. Very grateful for your type of colleague that you are. You are always ready to tell me to talk about the things that you are doing. Always ready to help the task that you have to be and strategic or administrative. We can soundboard with you, you are a mentor and a friend. Thank you so much that we can share your special and important evening with you. And you in this too is an example for us. Phil, it is only an honor to have you amongst us. You are kind, you are gracious, and working closely with you is proving not only to be an easy task, but also a joyful one. Thank you for approaching everything you do with care and detail. You are an extremely valuable member of our team. Congratulations in this incredible milestone. We are very, very proud of you. Now to get back to the word of thanks for tonight's proceedings. Uh, thank you for, for, uh, to Prof. Robert Balfour, Deputy Vice-Chancellor Teaching and Learning, for being present as presiding functionary this evening. Prof. Dumi, uh, Executive Dean of Humanities, for the word of welcome and for introducing Prof. Phil van Skalkwijk. We also appreciate the attendance of Prof. Myrna Nell, the Deputy Dean of Research and Innovation. A special word of thanks to the author, Perro Becker, and his wife for attending, and to his daughter, Anke, who made it his presence possible. Thank you to everyone who is here in person this evening and those who have joined us online. Thank you to Dalian Gai van Petiers, for from ceremonies, to the personnel of Krista Gali for what is provided here this evening, to Willem Boeta for the interpreting services, and Ben Boeta and his team for taking care of the techno technological side of things. Nicolien Gerber, who is not present here tonight, uh, made initial arrangements for this evening. Also, Ardis Ludic, who is the assistant tonight, thank you for your service. Uh, a big thanks to Lucinda Mulder and Anzel van Rensburg for their huge contribution to make this final arrangements and for their attention to detail. Please accept this token of our appreciation.
Um, last but definitely not least, thank you to each and every one of you for being here tonight in person and virtually, as Phil already said, and to share this moment with Phil um, in Phil's career with, his, with him tonight. I know this means a lot to him, and it is truly appreciated. Um, you are all invited to, uh, to have some refreshments, but first, if you want to take a picture with Phil, um, please move to the section where we got the, the clothing um, to take pictures with Phil. Um, thank you.